going to worship the Lord, and that which guides our worship is the Word of God. And so we always begin with the Word of God. And so if you would stand for the reading of God's Word, Psalm 133, we read these words of the psalmist. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil on the beard running down, uh, on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. Let's sing of God and his kingdom.
pray that today. That is our prayer. Your kingdom come and your will be done as you taught your disciples to pray. Father, we want to see your work accomplished. We want to see your name be made great. So, Lord, in this time, I pray that you would make your name great to us, that you would reveal anew yourself to us, so that, Lord, we would leave here a little different than when we came, that we would go out as your servants, as your ambassadors in the communities you've called us to. God, may you be praised in this time. Amen. to have a full house again. Uh, it's been summertime and a lot of people are going a lot of different places and for some people school starts up this week, right? Are you excited kids? <laughs> not so much, not so much. Are you excited parents? Hey, there we go, there we go. All right. Well, so good to have you all with us here and, uh, and for those of you listening online. Um, we apologize because I don't know if the camera's up and running yet, but uh, we, we did some networking this week, uh, changing things around. As you notice, we've moved some offices around and things are changing. And one of the things that we didn't check was the camera uh, uh, hookup. And so we apologize for that if, if you have problems there, but uh, we promise next week that'll be on. So if you can't see us, um, that's probably okay. 
Uh, but you can hear us, I'm, I'm assuming, as, uh, so hopefully you, you continue, continue listening in, those of you online. Um, a couple of announcements. First of all, on the 27th of this month, we're praying and hoping that everything's in place for us to celebrate the dedication of the new edition. Uh, we're excited about it. Uh, the CE board has met. We've designated classroom uh, space for different classes, and uh, we are excited about being able to use that new space. Uh, if some of you haven't been here in a couple weeks, you, you just said, wow, right? Um, appreciate all the work that's been done. We had a crew here this week, started um, putting up styrofoam and putting cement on the outside and all of that. That exterior should be finished up this week, and then uh, hopefully our carpet will be taken care of. Uh, the patchwork and the foyer is going to be done this week. So, um, yeah, things are moving ahead, and we are excited to, to see that all happening. And we want to have the dedication, and at that dedication, I'm hoping we can get some of those workers here to just say thank you and to honor them for the hard work that they have done, the great work I, I believe they've done. I've had the opportunity to meet them all, and it is truly a blessing uh, to be able to meet uh, these, these hardworking folk. Um, I talked to the, the crew, that most of them are Hispanic, and they have their own church that speaks their language, and so they probably won't be here, but um, we, we hope to see everyone else for that. That's uh, August 27th, and then September 10th. Now, now we're going to have donuts. Um, I, I talked to the deacons and deacons about, about doing donuts over there. They said, no, 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 no. We're going to do it downstairs. <laughs> so we'll, we'll ce celebrate. We'll, we'll, we'll sing a song, and, uh, and, and then we will pray and praise God, and we will acknowledge the work, and then we will come downstairs. We'll have donuts. And a couple weeks later, on September 10th, we're going to have donuts again. Um, so, and that's our back home Sunday. That's when we promote our children to the next grade. We, we hand out Bibles and all kinds of things. And uh, kids will be able to go see where their classes are going to be, that kind of thing. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're excited uh, for what God is doing. Um, but in order for some of that to happen, we need yet some Wednesday night helpers. So, and if you're willing to help out, Give a little of your time on Wednesday night for the Kids Club program. Please see Cheryl Lewis. She's the director of that. Uh, we would love to have you involved. Also, Children's Church. Uh, we're going to start that up again this fall. And I know some parents are cheering inside right now um, because the preschoolers sometimes can be difficult in, in the worship time. When the pastor gets up to preach, it gets like... How do I keep this kid under control? Anyway, um, we will start up Children's Church for preschoolers um, coming up this fall. But we need workers for that. And, and there is curriculum for you. Um, it's easy to, to pick it up and go through it. It's not a lot of work, but um, pick a Sunday. And, uh, or just put your name on the list. And Angie, Angie, where are you, Angie? We're in your normal seat, yes. Um, see Angie Pulse about that. We want to spend some time in prayer. And one of the people I want you to add to your prayer list, we're going to meet her in a little bit, uh, Katie Haskell. Uh, she's going to South Africa as a missionary, a medical missionary. And uh, she was sharing in Sunday school this morning I really appreciated what she had to say, the vision and, and passion she has for the people, the Zulu people there in South Africa. So be praying for Katie. Uh, she is in a process of support raising right now. I'm going to have her up in a little bit, not quite yet, um, just to share a little bit about what she's doing. Um, pray for uh, Tim Clark and his brother Dave. We didn't put Dave's name in the bulletin, but he too is re recovering after having some brain surgery to uh, release pressure on a brain, brain bleed. Um, pray for Dale Greeley going through stem cell treatments. For Hey, Mike Weaver, where are you, Mike? I think he's probably downstairs putting coffee pots away. Um, but uh, Mike Weaver's had a great week, and we've been praying for Mike, praying for his headaches. Praying for, he was out on his bicycle riding through town this week, which is, you know, something he hasn't done in a couple years. So pray, we praise God for working in Mike's life. Um, also, pray for, um, just a reminder, pray for Pastor Sergei and Alexander. They are the pastors that we support 
in Ukraine right now. And, uh, and so uh, some folks gave an annual gift to support them at $350 a month. That's what they need to survive on while this war wages on. So um, those are some of the announcements and s- some of the prayer concerns we have. So good to see Jan. We've been praying for Jan. Where did she go? Oh, there she is. She, she's in the back. And uh, so good to see Todd. And we've been praying for, keep praying for these folks um, as, they, um, as they battle different things. Good to see you, Carrie. C- Carrie, wh- wh- where'd you go? Oh, the, oh, she's still got the braces on. Okay, but keep praying for her. Uh, she's coming along. Um, let's just bow our heads. And let's give God the glory this morning. Father God, we come before you today acknowledging our weakness and your strength. Lord, we need you. We sing that song once in a while. Lord, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness, Lord, I need you. We need you for every day. We, We need you for our hope for the future. So, Lord Jesus, we put our trust in you, and and we thank you for the opportunity we have to intercede for those who are serving. We pray for Greg and Harlan as they serve at uh, at Prison Lighthouse Fellowship there at the State Penitentiary. Lord, we ask that you would uh, just continue to use them. I pray that you'd break down some of the barriers, both spiritual and real and physical barriers that exist right now at the pen. Pray for Larry and Mary Caldwell and his work um, uh, with Kairos and and that whole education program, educating pastors all around the world. Pray for Lori Harms at MTI as she uh, works with children there who are either returning or going out to the mission field. We pray for the Jacksons and the Roberts, Jacksons in, in Thailand, learning that language for, for the Roberts in Togo, learning French. Lord, I, I pray that you would just continue to use them. And for Matt and Emma Hyman and Eric and, and uh, Jessamine Unruh, um, Lord, as they do campus ministries, we pray especially for Jess and her ongoing seizures, that you would give her healing from that. We pray for James Scott as I, I think tomorrow or Tuesday he finishes up his um, non-speaking treatment for his um, strained vocal cords, Lord, that you just give him his voice back. Lord, we pray for uh, Spencer and Cassidy Hoyt there with Caravan Ministries in Tijuana, Mexico. And, uh, and Lord, we, we just pray especially today for Katie. And she is, is working to raise support so that she can go by the end of October to um, be with the people there, to, to work with the doctor um, there in South Africa to establish a medical clinic where people can come not only to receive medical care but also to hear the gospel. And as they w- do that work, supporting the planting of a church through the process. God, we, we pray that you would get her there. We pray for Pastor Sergei and Alexander as they serve the people of Ukraine. God, we we pray for a ceasing of that war, that you would rescue Christians there. And Lord, for the the dispersed uh, Ukrainians, Christians who've gone out to Poland and and Moldova and, and other countries in the area, Lord, we pray that you would just continue to use them to proclaim the gospel wherever they go. Lord, we thank you for Mike Weaver and, and his uh, just a, a good week this week. For, for Jason, we, we pray for strengthening in his body, for healing from MD, for Dale Greeley, that these treatments would be effective in, in fighting the cancer. We pray for Lucille with her hips and her knees and, and just the pain that she experiences with that. Lord, I pray for uh, just relief. For Tim and for Dave, uh, the Clark brothers, Lord, we, we ask that you would Grant them continued strength and healing in their bodies. For Jesse, we pray for continued um, sobriety as well as his salvation, Lord. For Lucy, and uh, so good to see her today. And for Carrie, good to see her. And just uh, and Jan, and the way you're working, Lord, in bringing healing and restoration. Lord, we pray for our men and women who are serving our country. We, we praise you for the fact that Peyton Hofer graduated from basic training this week and is, is headed off to her next stage of training. And we pray that you would bless her in that, Lord. We pray that you would um, 
just help her to learn well, that she would be um, th- that, that effective medic that she is going to be with the army. God, we thank you for your goodness, for your grace. We thank you for this opportunity to just enter into a time of worship, a time of prayer. How good and pleasant it is when your people dwell together in unity. Continue to guide us in that today and this week. We pray for the project, the addition. For the workers, we continue to pray for their safety and for just just work to be accomplished. We thank you for what you're doing in that. And Lord, may we do our part in using that tool for ministry, using it well. For the glory of your name, amen.
continue worshiping by giving our tithes and offerings. Father God, you have been so good to us, providing us with our every need. Guide us now as we give. May you use these gifts for your kingdom's purposes, for your glory. Amen.
Katie, would you, would you join me for just a moment here, please? Katie Haskell is sister to John Haskell. John and Renee um, have been a part of our church for a while now. And, uh, and recently, I got an email from Katie saying, I'm Katie, I'm John's sister, and I'm going to South Africa um, to minister among the what people? Zulu, Zulu people, yeah. Um, and w- what will you be doing there, Katie? Come on over here. People back there can't see you, so they want to see you. Uh, yeah, so I'm a nurse, so I'll be helping establish uh, a clinic with a local doctor, um, along with several other ministries that are already going on there. So, okay. Yeah. And I already mentioned you hope to depart, uh, to go there mm-hmm. in October. And what, are, what will the first year be like for you there? So the first year I'll live near a um, local church we work with, and I'll learn the language, uh, get my nursing license, Um, really get to know the culture well. And then I will move into the rural area um, and live in a house um, in the village um, to minister to the people there. And what is the name of that area? So the Olwasini Valley is where we minister. Okay, and it's the Seven Rivers? Yes, Seven Rivers is the ministry. So that entails a lot of different ministries, and this is just the new, like, outreach that we're using. Okay, and, and, and Katie, tell us again what agency you're going with. Uh, it's called Biblical Ministries Worldwide, um, and they have a Compassion Medical team. So I'm actually the first long-term placement for Compassion Medical. And how long are you going to be there? Uh, so long-term. So every term is about three years. Um, but, I mean, ministering to those people however long God leads. So. Well, it's, um, I have watched in our own denomination, I remember being a kid growing up in a Baptist General Conference at that time, now Converge Church, Hmm. and I remember um, Eschenauer was her, um, and and another uh, one who was a nurse that that went to uh, African people and uh, in the Ivory Coast, and uh, so medical missions is important. Why? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the Lord had compassion on these people, and you know, not only is He the life, but He also brought physical you know, healing to them as well. Um, So that's just a way that we care for the people um, and use that as an open door then to also share the gospel with them. So you're partnering with a church plant in the area then? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, yes. Kind of giving them support and and, uh, bringing the light of the gospel into people, not only physically, but also spiritually. Mm -hmm. What are some ways that we can pray for you, Katie? Uh, A lot of different ways. Uh, Lately it's been visa issues, and I feel like that's just um, extending longer and longer. It could take several months when I hope to be there by October. Um, so pray for the visa, pray for language learning, um, and then, of course, as I raise support um, and work on getting my licensure there. So. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Let, let yeah. me just pray for you. Father God, we thank you for Katie, and thank you for her, her obedience on the call that you've given her to go to the Zulu people. Father, we pray that as she is going church to church, person to person, to raise a a prayer team and a a financial support team, Lord, that you would lay it on the hearts of individuals, lay it on the hearts of groups of people to come alongside and to share and partner in this ministry. God, we give you honor and glory and praise for the way you've worked in her life and the way you're going to continue to work through her um, in this ministry. Um, of building up and and establishing this medical clinic in this rural area of um, South Africa. God, you are good. We want to see the nations praise your name. So use this ministry, use, use this woman for your honor, for your glory, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's exciting, so exciting, and uh, so is this. Um, I've been at this for 30 years here now, and some of you, I I realize, it's it's a long time to listen to one person talk. (laughs) 
right? I get that. Um, and the older I get, the more forgetful I get, so the more I got to cling to my notes, right? Uh, but um, there's a benefit to growing older. It's called senior citizen discounts. <laughs> and uh, this week, I'm, I'm going to start enjoying them. Uh, we went out to dinner last night and forgot to ask for the senior citizen discount. I was like, ugh. Anyway, um, it is so good. I, I am loving being in God's word um, more and more. Every year I'm here, and I will never get tired. Sometimes I get frustrated because, oh, it's just not, it's not flowing, you know. The juices, as, as we minister, the juices aren't flowing. And, uh, but, but yet I, I still take this seriously. I, I still take it as a great joy and a privilege to be able to share with you, to impart to you the Word of God. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to finish up today. Next week, we start Titus. Because this is in a longer series called the Pastoral Epistles. So chapter 4, last week we looked at the first part of chapter 4. Paul saying, I am already being poured out as a drink offering. We know that he is very near the end of his life. And so what we're going to read today are some of his final requests to this one who he has written to, this disciple, Timothy. He says, do your best to come to me soon. Verse 9. Do your best to come to me soon, for Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. And he's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you. For he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all, the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm, and the Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Troph Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, and Pudens and Linus and Claudia and all the brothers. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. Father, thank you for these words. Help us now to understand uh, maybe just a, a little glimpse of Paul's heart here. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul writing to Timothy, who is the pastor at the church at Ephesus. And as I said, next week we, we're going to look at Titus, another one of Paul's um, pastors out there. And as I read this, I, I pondered um, what it is like to be a part of Christian community. Because all the stuff that Paul talks about here is related to his, his part and, and, and his involvement in Christian community. There are these whom he has identified as brothers in the faith. And one of the things we learn is that being a part of Christian community has both rewards and it has risks. There are risks and rewards in Christian community. You spend any length of time in a family, whether it's your biological family, maybe an adoptive family, a church family, you're going to get hurt, right? But from that same family comes great blessing great encouragement, great support, great strength. 
So here in Paul's final words, these final requests to Timothy, we see how he experienced both the delights and disappointment of being a part of a Christian community. A few few weeks ago, our campus um, um, ministry uh, missionary, um, Eric Unruh, was here sharing about establishing a new ministry there, a new campus ministry with Chi Alpha on the campus of Colorado State in Boulder. The agency he works with, the way that they go about establishing ministries on college campuses is they just try to create these small groups called community. They just call them communities, faith communities. Because what they found out is a lot of students who come to campus as a freshman are looking for some place to be a part of, some group to be a part of, some family to be a part of. And there's all different organizations on college campuses looking to grab those students and to to draw them in. So as a Christian faith community, they're offering more than just something to do. They're offering them a home, a family to become a part of. They call it Christian community. Some of you who hopefully are still with us online listening this morning, um, some of you are not here today because in the process of being part of a Christian community, you've been offended, you've been hurt, and you just find it hard to be here. Most of you here this morning have experienced the, the benefits, the joy, the blessing of Christian community here at Sun Prairie. Maybe, maybe you walked through the door for the first time and somebody greeted you and said, welcome. And I, I so appreciate folks here that do that. Maybe somebody even invited you out for dinner one Sunday. It's a blessing to be a part of Christian community. But sometimes... There are hurts, there are wounds that come about from people that we call our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because you know what? As long as there are people in the church, we're going to have problems. It's just the reality of being part of this human race. We sometimes don't get along. We sometimes do things that are selfish. We sometimes do things that are hurtful. And as with most things in life, you've got to sometimes take the good with the bad. Sometimes you got to put up with some hard, hard things. Doesn't mean we can't do better, church, right? In fact, I think those bad experiences should cause us to do better. And we must. We must. You know, when I meet with our caregiving team, our deacon and deaconess board, um, they're, they're the ones that I see the most doing that, that work of... Um, providing Christian community. They're the ones who are reaching out. And, and I, I'm always reminding them, we got to do better. we got to do better. We can do better. And so it, it's, it's a work that all of us have to work on. You know, I, I have to apologize last week to our deacon deaconess board. I have to apologize. Last week I w- went home, and Dee and I always talk about the service. She says, what was going on with you? You were so harsh to those deacons. It's like, come on up, you know, and I didn't realize. Um, uh, and I see some of them laughing. He did it. Yeah, he did. Uh, I apologize. Um, sometimes, I, I don't know, we, I can do better. <laughs> because here's, here's the reality. We live in a world where people need community. They need us. Recently, Uh, The U.S. Surgeon General declared that we are experiencing in America an epidemic of loneliness. The Center for Disease Control found that one in three people, 45 years or older, one in three claim to be severely lonely. I think lonely is severe (laughs) uh, if you're lonely, but one in three people, 45 and older, are just lonely They're looking for someone to connect with. And you know what? Social media hasn't helped out one bit in that. In response to that statistic, Representative Chris Murphy of Connecticut introduced legislation legislation this past week. 
to establish a White House Office of Social Connections policies. How do you think that's going to go? Folks, the government isn't supposed to take care of the lonely. He's established family. God has established family and the church to deal with the problem. The family and the church. We are the ones responsible to care for the lonely. In addition to the proclamation of the gospel and training of faithful servants, uh, Christ established the family and the church to deal with loneliness. We are positioned for such a time as this. When one in three people is lonely and, and we've got the solution. God has put us here. God has placed us in this world that is so lonely and, and, and we've got the solution. Well, let's get to our text. What was Paul's experience with Christian community? He begins with these final words with Timothy by pleading with Timothy, do your best to come soon, to come quickly. He longed for what he had experienced previously in his um, ministry work, in his uh, just getting to know Timothy. He was like a dad to Timothy. He called him my son. Um, back in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of this letter, um, and also back in his first letter, he refers to Timothy as my son. Paul and Timothy had a great relationship. So the first thing we see in these, this final request uh, is the reward of community, the reward of companionship, of intimacy. They were partners in church planting. They were fellow servants in the church of Jesus Christ. They relied on each other. And Paul discipled Timothy, and Timothy supported Paul in his ministry. They were a great combination. And now in his final days, just prior to the cold of winter setting in, which would prevent Timothy from getting there, Paul says, come quickly. Paul understood that when the winter set in, that trip from Ephesus to Rome would not be easy because Paul was in prison in Rome in the Mamertine uh, prison and he said come quickly come quickly he so longed for that intimacy once again with this person he referred to as his son first and foremost he desires that fellowship intimacy it's the reward of being part of Christian community. You can't get it from social media. You can't even get it from church online. If you think church online is church, that is community, it's not. We provide a streaming service, an online service, for people who can't be here for whatever reason. Maybe they're on vacation and they want to tune in. Uh, when I'm gone, I always tune in uh, to to just get a sense of what's going on that day at church. But you can't experience community in that. Even those churches that are really active in their online presence where they're doing the chat thing and people are, are chatting as they're listening and, and all of that, it's still not community. I don't know about you, but I need to talk to people face to face. I, I need to be able to shake a hand. I need to be able to embrace in a hug. I need to see their eyes. You can't get that from church online. We were created for intimacy, for fellowship, for sharing of life with other people, other believers, like-minded believers. Uh, did, did anyone happen to notice what's happened with the new edition? Did you happen to notice that there's a little more space? It's been my dream for years to expand our foyer. And when, when me and some of Howard's guys were, were knocking down the walls to my old office, I was so excited. Because in my head, I have this vision of people hanging out at church for an hour or two, just hanging out and visiting. And I'm hoping we can put maybe a couple chairs. I put those chairs out there just to kind of give you an idea of how it might, how it might be. And we've got a whole other visiting area on the other end, Right? We can have multiple sites of people just hanging out with each other. And instead of, you know, just being in here, we, we can spread out. 
It's been kind of a goal and a vision of mine for years. And, and we're getting there. And it's so exciting to anticipate being able to hang out, to share life. There are also other places where we get to do that. Again, I'm excited for Kim's men's Bible study. Any of you men um, going to be there Wednesday night? Okay. If you've never experienced Kim's Wednesday night Bible study, let me encourage you men. It's, it's, a, it's an experience. It's, it's great. And then, and then there's uh, the women's Bible study, both in the morning and in the evening. They're going to be meeting in the great room uh, down at the end of the hall upstairs here. And um, Dee is excited about that, and she's excited to see who will come to the morning group, who's going to come to the evening group. Um, she's already got the curriculum picked out, the study picked out. So um, encourage you ladies. How many of you ladies are involved in that or are planning to be involved in that? Yeah, look at that. Men, hey, we got to match that, okay? These are groups where we get to share life together. Not only are they studying the Bible, they're sharing life together. They're praying for each other. That's what we call Christian community. It's, it's that intimacy that's created in a smaller group. We, we can't really get that intimacy when I'm standing up here, here preaching to y'all. We, we, this is a part of worship, yes, the Word of God in worship. But it's really what happens before and after where that community takes place. I can share with you a little bit about my life, my week, but you're not responding back to me. No man or woman is an island. We need each other. We need each other. We were created in the image of God who is relational. And I, I believe that that's part of what that image of God in us I includes is this need to be relational, this ability to be relational. Because God, the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, have intimate relationship with each other. We were created to be the same, to need that, to, to experience that kind of intimacy with one another. Christian community, it's a great thing. Christian community is not everything we need or everything we think it should be, but we still need this church family. I need you, and you need me. We need each other. Amen? Amen. Friends are, 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 are good for what happens next. Timothy, Paul's friend, what, 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 is, what does uh, Paul say? I need something. <laughs> I need you to bring me my coat. Remember, he's in this Mamertine prison, which is basically like a, a sewer hole, uh, and underneath is this big cave. It's been carved out. It's still there. And it was cold. It was dark. A lot of people died there being eaten by rats. Um, it, it was just a, a terrible, terrible thing. And so Paul says to Timothy, who would have not had his coat with him because he left it in Troas with Carpus. So he says, hey, when you come, bring my coat. And there's a couple of other things I want you to bring. I want you to bring uh, my books. I want you to bring the parchments. Now, the books would have probably been the Old Testament uh, for, for Paul, the Torah, but he also wanted his, his parchments, which would likely have been, scholars believe that that would have been um, a record of the life of Jesus, the go early Gospels. And so he, he wanted this for himself because in his last days, he wanted the things most dear to him, his friend Timothy and the Word of God. When I am with people in their final hours, most of the time, I have my Bible, whether I bring it hard copy or on my phone, e either way, I read the Word of God. Because in the Word of God, there's great comfort. Paul would find great strength. He would find great comfort. He would find encouragement in this very, very dark, dark time in his life. 
if you could just have the word. Just to reread the life of Jesus. One of the things we find in uh, prison ministry is how much some of the men come to love the Word of God. Right, Norm? I mean, some of these guys are just, they're in a cell many hours a day. And what do they do? They open their Bible and they just start reading and studying. And they long for commentaries and, and those kinds of things to help them in their studies. Some of them are doing online Bible degrees because they find great encouragement. They find great hope in the Word of God. And that's, that's why Paul is asking Timothy to bring those things for him. You know, it's, it's like Christian community, what do we do? We say, hey, if, if you're, um, you, you, you might call your friend and say, or, or text them, you know, are, are you in Sioux Falls? I heard you're going to Sioux Falls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are you going to Costco? Can you pick me up that 100-roll uh, toilet paper? I, I, we're, we're all out. Um, that, that's what friends are for, right? To, to do those kinds of things. And so much more. That's what community is about. There are some of you I can count on when I, I, I'm gone and I think, oh my goodness, I left the hose on. <laughs> hey, can you go over to the house and turn my hose off? There's some local people I call to do that. Or um, we're on vacation and, uh, you know, something's happened. Can you go check on the house? There's always people to do that. What else did Paul ask Timothy to bring to him? He said, please bring Mark. John Mark. The guy whom Paul to told Barnabas to leave behind when they were setting out on their second missionary journey. And the reason was that John Mark had abandoned him on the first trip. He just said, I'm out of here. And he walked away. And Paul was so upset with John Mark fo following that episode that on their next missionary journey, um, Barnabas said, hey, let, let's bring John Mark again. And Paul said, no way. In fact, J uh, Paul and Barnabas parted ways on that journey because Barnabas persisted that John Mark was going to come along. Paul said, no, not with me. What happened in the meantime where Paul says to Timothy, bring Mark with you because he is a great help to me in ministry. This is a lesson for us in the church. Somebody abandons us. Somebody hurts us. What's the first thing we need to do? We need to get reconciled. We need to make things right with that person, right? We got to do it. Instead of avoiding them, instead of getting away from them, instead of not going to church because ah, so and so's there, we need to get reconciled. Paul did that somewhere along the way. He reconciled with John Mark, so much so that he told Timothy, He is a great help to me in ministry. What a great lesson. We need to take what Paul said to the church at Ephesus when he wrote the, the letter to the Ephesians um, to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Even when you don't feel like reconciling, you're really ticked off at that person. Because we love Jesus, we're going to do it. We're going to make things right because we love Jesus. I use that in, in my marriage sermons all the time, wedding sermons all the time. Because he follows it up, wives submit to your husbands. How does a wife submit to a husband when he's just um, uh, dishonored her in some way, embarrassed her in some way? How, how does she submit to that? Because she loves Jesus. She's going to do what the Word says. How does a husband love his wife when she has just been nagging on him, nagging on him, nagging on him? Because he loves Jesus. That's what he's going to do. Right? Desertion and abandonment is a risk of being part of Christian community, any, any meaningful relationship. Paul does point out that one person did stay with him. And what better person? Luke the doctor. <laughs> I mean, if you're in a hole in the ground, this prison where there's rat infested, you're, you're going to want a doctor nearby, 
who can maybe toss some, I don't know, medical supplies, whatever they were in that day, down the hole to help you out. Whatever the case, Luke stayed behind. But he references all of these people who deserted him. And what does he say about them? May God forgive them. May God have mercy. You know, I, some of these desertions would have happened as a result of fear. Here's, here's Paul. He's, he's uh, received a death sentence, basically, almost. He's almost there, waiting for his final trial. He's had that initial hearing. Nobody was there to stand with him, he said. And many deserted. They left town. Probably because they were afraid. In fact, Paul warns Timothy that when you come, be careful. In fact, watch out for this guy, the coppersmith, right? Watch out for him. And it's likely that the coppersmith was the guy whose testimony was reason that Paul was in prison under this death sentence. And so Paul warns Timothy, watch out. He can cause you great harm. And so, you can understand why some people would have deserted them. Maybe they were running for their lives. We don't know. And so Paul is gracious. May God forgive them. But he ends with this. Even though many deserted me, yet the Lord stood by me and strengthened me so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. We don't really know what the lion's, lion reference was about. Maybe it was a literal, you know, potential of being thrown into the den of lions. I think it may have been talking about Nero. that human tyrant. But notice that Paul, who would be beheaded shortly with Peter by order of Emperor Nero, notice his positive outlook. He points to how God has used him to proclaim the gospel to all the Gentiles. In fact, while imprisoned the first time, what happened to Caesar's house, to Caesar's guards? Paul was able to witness the gospel to him. Gentiles of Gentiles. And they got to hear the gospel because Paul was sent there as a prisoner. And think of these words that we have recorded of Paul's gospel proclamation, how they have been preached even till today to men and women and children of every people group, almost every people group. We're still working on that. But the words of Paul have gone out. The, the words of the gospel have gone out into all the world. So he can be positive about what God has done in his life and through him. His ministry continues almost 2,000 years after his death. And not only does the Lord enable the ministry of Paul, but God does rescue him. Even when he had his head chopped off, God rescued him into eternal glory. And he was looking forward to that. Remember, this is the same guy who said, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. And we as believers have that hope. That when we die, it's going to be better. It's not worse. Yeah, maybe the process will be tough. But it's going to get better. So not only does the Lord enable the ministry of Paul... He rescues him to eternal life in Christ. And for that, he rejoices. Family, this community of faith is to be a place where we uphold one another and where we are held up by one another. But that can only happen when each of us takes that risk and jumps into relationships, into intimacy with one another taking the time it takes to hang out. 
in the foyer, over coffee, out for dinner. We are the hope of a lonely, lonely world. And we need to take that seriously. I know it can be scary. For some of us, like, like myself, I, 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 this is a weird position for an introvert. Um, hey, Katie, she, she confessed to being an introvert this morning in Sunday school. I, I just got to say, you, you do a great job in front of people, you know, sharing your vision and, and passion for lost people. But, but you know what? We need to step out of our comfort zone sometimes and be the church, be that Christian community that we all need. We all need it. So let's take the time, let's expend the energy, and let's take the risk that sometimes is involved in creating that Christian community. And when you get let down, remember that there are others, and ultimately there is Jesus to pick you up. Let's close by singing this morning. You'll know we are Christians by our love. This world is looking for a place where they can feel welcome, where they can feel whole, at home. May we, the church, be that. Let's stand and sing with the band this morning. I pray if there's somebody here this morning who is not a part of the community because they're not a part of you. They have never given their life to you. I pray that right now they would confess, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner and I need you. Please forgive me. I give my life to you. 
And then, Lord, help us, all the rest of us, to welcome them into the family for the glory of your name, for the building of your church, which you said will be built. Continue to do it. Amen.